Today it is time to tackle the utterly pointless ventilation. Hi folks, welcome back to our little mini series about creating a downstairs toilet and utility room as part of our extension project. Quite a lot has happened since last time. So as you can see, I've got the little basin in. That was a pain in the backside. We've also got all of the supply pipe work done. I think we had most of that. <laughs> The basin's actually leaking already, which was kind of expected. So I'm going to show you how I go about fixing that while trying not to fall over. And if I shift this out the road, you will see that we've managed to get this back wall in and that was actually, it went surprisingly smoothly. It just kind of slid into place, measured out where the hole needed to go at the bottom and the cutouts where all that's going to be getting boxed in anyway. A few other little things that I've done as well is I've foamed all around this bottom edge just to stop drafts coming up from under the floor because once that's all boxed in, it's not going to be very easy getting to that. So it's all nice and insulated, insulated around all the pipes in the corner there that go through the extension and as you can see I've made the boxing framework at the top there just to house the extraction duct work that was pretty straightforward so I'm not going to show you that in any detail I've made other videos about boxing if you want to know more about that anyway today's video is all going to be about ventilation all the building regs requirements surrounding that but before we do that I'm going to fix this leaky sink I'll show you what the problem is you always have this sort of problem with these rubbish wastes that you get. I'm not particularly impressed with anything I've bought here to be honest but uh, such is life. Before I do anything I just need to clean this up because it's covered in dust. So there's not really a single part of this that I'm happy with. The sink's not particularly great, the waste isn't great and it's leaking. I'm not particularly happy with this bottle trap. The whole thing looks pig ugly but I'm gonna kind of box it in. I'm going to make a little kind of vanity unit thing. In hindsight, you can get the vanity units with the sink included. I was being a cheapskate and went down the route of buying the basin separately. But uh, in hindsight, it probably would have been a better route to just buy a vanity unit with everything ready done. But it means that later down the line, we're going to have a little vanity unit project. And I'll show you how I go about building one of those. But basically the problem we've got is that it's all fitted as per the manufacturer's instructions and it's leaking here. To be honest, they always end up leaking there and I don't know why I thought this would be any different, but I always kind of live in hope that one day I'll fit stuff as per the manufacturer's instructions and it actually works. You see, a lot of better designs are kind of leak proof by design so even if water got around like the edge it would still funnel down and into the trap but this isn't leak proof by design basically if water gets underneath this edge that's the problem that we've got even though there's a gasket underneath that but if water gets underneath that edge it literally just comes out um, on this thread and just drips down onto the floor so that's no good so we'll take all of this out I'll take this off as well. I mean, this is well tightened on, really well tightened to the point I can't actually get it off. And as I say, it is fitted as per the way you're supposed to fit it. So basically we've got a nut on the bottom, we've got this little washer thing there, little nylon washer. We've then got the gasket, the big thick casket that goes on the bottom. Take that off. And then if I pull the waste out, we've got a gasket on the bottom of the waste there. And that's the bit that's leaking. It, as I say, it always leaks. It's rubbish. I don't know why they even bother. So I find plumbers mates are the best option for this. You can silicon it in, but silicon's a bit permanent. And if you discover a later date that you need to like take it off or whatever. I think plumbers made for something like this. I generally prefer, but it's, it's up to you, whatever you prefer to do. Silicon or plumbers mates, fine. Just make sure everything's nice and clean, nice and dry. So you don't need a huge amount of this stuff. 
And plumber's mate, it's like an, a non-setting, like a non-setting putty type stuff. So you're going to make a little sausage. You need to work quite quickly because if your hands are warm, that's far too much. If your hands are warm, it starts to stick to your hands. I'm going to put it on, I'm going to put it on the plug rather than on the sink itself. Don't be shy with it. Ah, you see, it's sticking to us. That actually feels like there's not enough. So no wonder the um, no wonder the gasket's not working. The gasket mustn't have been made in, making any contact <laughs> with the uh, sink, because if you imagine the little gasket that came with it, <sighs> so that was the gasket. And you see how much plumber's mate I've got on. I'm actually going to double this up. We're going to need so much. Sometimes it's just down to the shape of the waist. Just don't go too much because what can happen is it can go down the middle and it can block the overflow outlet. So just be careful not to block that. But that seems all pretty good. And when you put the plug in, if you give it just a little twist and do it from underneath, as you kind of bed it in. Not too much, just oh, no more than probably an eighth of a turn, but it just kind of smears it into the joints a little bit, or smears it into the basin a little bit. That'll do. And now I'll reattach everything and then I can come round and uh, cut that little bit of excess off. It's also worth adding a whole load of PDFE tape around this thread As I say, different wastes seem to behave in slightly different ways, but I can see this is just not going to play ball. So hopefully this will sort it out. So a nice sharp blade for this. And just kind of tease it away. As I say, if you handle it for too long, it sticks to your hands and it's a bit of a nightmare to get off. And then I'll just clean it with a little bit of um, methylated spirits, denatured alcohol. If you leave too much of this in, don't like poke your knife down under the edge because you'll destroy the seal but if you leave it where you can actually see the putty the putty will turn black over time so if you've got a, as a little tip for you if you've got like a black ring around your base and waist sometimes you can just cut it off with a sharp knife but sometimes depending on how badly it was fitted in the first place. Sometimes that can be the only thing stopping it from leaking. So, <laughs> yeah. 
swings and roundabouts. Anyway, that's done. We are looking good. Right, another problem fixed. So, on to ventilation, let me just get a quick hole drilled in this piece of plasterboard. And I will explain what's going on. Right, I'm just going to temporarily put this board up. hoping you can see again it's one of these things it's so difficult to show you because generally I'm going to be in the road but you'll get the general idea of what I'm doing so I want that to be nice and flush to the front of this So I've already attached a little bit of flexi hose onto the T-piece here. That leads through into the utility on the left hand side there. And then I'm just using these uh, passive little vent cover things. The kit that I bought came with a white one and a chrome one. So we're using the white on the utility side and we're using the, the chrome inside here. They do kind of vaguely friction fit in. I'm not going to actually screw it in yet. But anyway, this front bit comes off, but <laughs> For whatever reason to get the front off you turn it clockwise the way that you would normally tighten something which is just a bit odd so anyway that front little bezel comes off and then you've got screw holes underneath I'm just gonna poke that up there is it gonna stay yep and then if I can find it where's my clippy thing gone you would not believe how I've had to set the camera up for this <laughs> I'll include a picture if it hasn't fallen down by then. Anyway, so, oh, don't forget about that. Pop this over the duct first. You can use zip ties, by the way. But I think these are just a bit more kind of professional. I'm not going to screw this into the ceiling quite yet because for decorating and like plastering and all that sort of thing, it's probably going to end up getting in the road, but we can connect the duct to it. Before you go mega tight, just double check. It's definitely properly seated on all the way around, which it is. Looks pretty good. Don't over tighten it because you can easily break these little um, passive vents. That is good. That is fine. We've got a little bit of play there. That'll all be tightened up once we're screwed in place. So, and then, as I say, we've got a little bit of play on this. So, once we've kind of got the cover plate on, which goes like that, then you can get it exactly correct so that it, it just sits nice, do you know what I mean? So that the lines go parallel to the wall on the vent, it just looks nicer. You don't want it at some random angle. Anyway, we'll leave that off for now, because, uh, as I say, we'll not put that on until we've done the decorating and whatnot. But just bear in mind, with these stupid bezels, you turn it to the right to get the bezel off, not to the left. Anyway, let's have a chat about ventilation, building regs, and why we're doing everything like this. So folks, building regulations, and I'm recording this kind of in future time because the timeline of this project is all over the shop. 
Anyway, if you're intrigued about how UK building regulations work, if you just search for UK building regulations and just watch out for scams and things like that, you don't have to pay for them, they're free to download, and just make sure that you're downloading them off the gov.uk website. And the thing that you're looking for is the approved document index. So this is basically the page you're looking for. And if we just scroll down, you can see here we've got a merged approved document. So what that means, that is essentially, as far as I'm aware, this is the entire UK building regulations in one single document. It's like all the sections merged together. And as you can see, that is 1,504 pages long. So instead of attempting to scroll through all that, I'm just going to click down here where we've got the separate versions of all the approved documents and then you can get into all the various sections. So for example, we've got structure, which is section A, fire safety at section B. We're going to be talking more on fire safety a little bit later down the line. We've also got things like resistance to sound, drainage, waste disposal, all that sort of thing. The thing that we're looking for here is section F, which is ventilation. And if I click through onto that, I'm looking for the one that applies to dwellings. Uh, section 2 or Volume 2 applies to buildings other than dwellings, because obviously the building regs cover commercial buildings and all sorts of things. So at the time of this video going live, this is the document that you should be looking at. And as you can see, that is a 2021 edition for use in England. But the thing that you need to look out for, and this is why I prefer to look at the building regs as separate documents rather than the merged documents, is that these get updated periodically. And as you can see, for example, fire safety, that's from December 2022, but toxic substances, that hasn't been updated since December 2010. And to cut a long story short, the version of building regs that applied when our extension was all designed and signed off by building regs before the work started, wasn't this version of the ventilation document. It actually makes no difference because the stuff that's changed in it isn't relevant to our extension anyway. But this is something you absolutely need to be aware of if you are doing any kind of building project, is to make sure that you're looking at the correct approved document for the work that you're doing. For example, the latest version of part L of the building regs, which uh, came into effect, uh, well, it's a 2021 edition, but you can see here, this document takes effect on the 15th of June, 2022, and basically it doesn't apply to work where the building notice was submitted before that date, providing the work for each building is started before 15th of June, 2023. This would have affected us in a really big way because the new requirements for insulation and all that sort of thing are way more stringent than they were when we started our build. One of many reasons why extensions are becoming prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. But anyway, rewinding back to 2021-22, when we started our project, this is the version of the Part F document that we need to be looking at. And this is the one published in, well, this is a 2010 edition incorporating 2010 and 2013 amendments. So this ventilation document, 63 pages, it's not huge in the scheme of things, so it's quite an easy one to digest. The way building regs work, in case you're wondering, is that it starts off by telling you what the actual law is. So for example here, there shall be adequate means of ventilation provided for people in the building, fixed systems, blah blah blah. Anyway, so that is the section from the UK legislation. And then what it goes on to do is that it gives you guidance as to what you need to do to meet the requirements of the legislation. Generally speaking, you're best doing everything as per the way that it's spelled out in this guidance document, but there are other ways of doing stuff. A lot of stuff is open to interpretation. Perhaps you've got an independent building regulations consultant involved and they might assess things in a different way. But for the sake of simplicity, if you do your work as per the way that they're telling you to do it in here, it'll almost certainly get signed off. Another thing worth mentioning as well is that sometimes the requirements for a brand new house are a lot more stringent than, for example, an extension onto an existing house. So just keep that in mind when you're looking through the building regs and make sure that it does apply to an existing property rather than a new build. 
But the bit that we're looking at here, I think it's on page 19, and we are looking at this section here, extract ventilation rates. And the thing that we're interested in, obviously, is a utility room, and that says that we need a minimum extraction rate of 30 litres per second. And we've also got the downstairs toilet, so that's sanitary accommodation, and that needs extraction of 6 litres per second. And then if we read further through the regs, it says extract ventilation to outside is required in each kitchen, utility room, bathroom and sanitary accommodation. The extract can be either intermittent or continuous, but obviously we don't want extraction fans running all the time underneath our bedroom, so we'll have intermittent. Thank you very much. And it goes on to say that the rates are specified in table 5.1a. Oh, and it's also worth mentioning that if we had a window in the toilet, then we might not need the extraction. I'm not sure. Uh, either way, we don't have a window, so we're going to have to have an extractor of some description. But anyway, it is worth checking what they mean by utility room. Let's check the definition. So there's a whole section of definitions and key terms. And here's the definition of a utility room here. A utility room is a room containing a sink or other feature or equipment which may reasonably be expected to produce water vapour in significant quantities. Well, okay, we're going to have a washing machine and tumble dryer in the room, but modern washing machines and tumble dryers don't produce any water vapour at all. In fact, I've monitored the humidity levels in our utility room before the work was done, and when the tumble dryer and washing machine are switched on, there is no change to the humidity in the room whatsoever because they're much more efficient these days. Everything basically goes down the drain. But it does say, unfortunately, a utility room is a room containing a sink or feature. So it's going to have a sink. So there's no getting away from it. It is going to be classed as a utility room. If it didn't have a sink in it, we could have probably got away with saying that it's not a utility room, but we could really do with a sink. And as such, that means we're stuck with needing an extract rate of 30 litres per second for a sink that creates no water vapour whatsoever. So it's a bit pointless, but we're going to have to tick the boxes. There's nothing that we're going to do about it, really. I would imagine most reasonable building inspectors would probably like brush over this. But, you know, we want it to get signed off, so we're going to have to make sure it's done correctly. But one thing I know that you're going to ask about is, shouldn't the extraction be controlled via a light switch? And the answer is, well, as far as I'm aware, no, it doesn't need to be. Because if we look here, controls, intermittent extraction, may be operated manually. I mean, it does go on to say, and or automatically by a sensor. But one interesting thing is, is that if it's a toilet, you're not supposed to have it being triggered by a humidity sensor. Because look, it says here, humidity controls should not be used for sanitary accommodation as odour is the main pollutant. So there's an interesting one. If you've got a toilet in your bathroom and you've got the fan being triggered on humidity levels, I don't think that technically meets building regs. But another thing we need to bear in mind here is that it says in a room with no openable window, in other words, an internal room, which is what we've got, an intermittent extraction fan needs to have a 15 minute overrun. So you can't have a fan that just switches off as soon as you switch the switch off. When you switch the fan switch off, the fan needs to keep going for at least 15 minutes. And it goes on to say, in rooms with no natural light, the fans could be controlled by the operation of the main room light switch, but it doesn't have to be. It says at the top there, it can be manually operated. Also an interesting point here, fans should be quiet so as to not discourage their use by occupants. That's an interesting one. But anyway, just to kind of wrap all of this up, we've established that the extraction is probably going to be pointless other than to remove smells from the toilet. We need an extraction rate of 6 litres per second for the loo and 30 litres per second for the utility room that produces no water vapour whatsoever. It needs to have 15 minute overrun, which means that we're going to have to have a permanent live and a switched live going through to the fan. And we're okay for it to be controlled via a switch, but we're also going to have to have a 3 amp fused spur as per the requirements that are outlined in the instructions for the fan. If you didn't have that, it would mean that you've got no way of isolating power to the fan because you're going to need to have control over the permanent live and the switched live. 
And to avoid having a million ventilation ducts on the outside of the house, all we're going to do is we're going to have both of these rooms being extracted at the same time. So we'll have a passive extractor in the WC and we'll have a passive extractor in the utility. We'll put an inline extractor in the garage and then you've already seen the ducting run through with a T-piece on it. That'll connect to the WC and the utility and then wind its way around to the inline fan. That has backdraft protection built into it and then that just feeds out via a single flappy vent cover thing on the back of the property. Oh, and I've briefly touched on this, but it'll be covered in much more detail later on. But every single penetration through this garage wall needs intumescent fire protection. So fire collars or whatever, depending on the thing that's going through the wall, because the garage needs to have a 30 minute fire barrier between itself and the rest of the house. Anyway, hope that all makes sense. As I say, it's a little bit pointless. It's created a lot of extra work, but it ticks the boxes that needed to be ticked for building regs. Right, so, 100 mil duct, same as before. Um, I've just got some little brackets that I've put in the wall and I'm cable tying this in place. Oh, man. oh no, cable ties aren't long enough. You are kidding me. The cable ties provided with the duct aren't long enough to reach around the duct. Isn't that just unbelievable? Holy moly. See if I can find some extra cable ties to add on. I honestly thought one of the few things a company couldn't muck up is a cable tie going around a duct. But I underestimated how useless companies are these days again. I have to redo all of these ones. As I say, the <laughs> these cable ties came with the duct. <laughs> they don't reach around the duct. <laughs> Take two. Oh, talk about making a job. Unnecessarily difficult. Good grief. Uh. Right, anyway, where's my little bit of flexi? So, same as before, I've got a little, what do you call it? Uh, it's like a giant jubilee clip. Actually, I'm going to put that on after because it's a little bit tricky slipping this over the bigger pipe. I'm kind of, um, I don't want to use too much flexi because obviously it's susceptible to damage. So where possible, I'd rather use uh, rigid ducting. But some of these joins and things, it would be really awkward trying to do it as, as rigid. going anywhere. So I've just had to run a little bit of flexi over the flue because it's a little bit of a tight squeeze but we're all good. One other thing that I want to show you here on the inline fan because it's quite interesting. Sorry, fitting the camera in here is going to be really tricky. But I've had to put this on a little shelf because if you can see we've got a backdraft flap on the back and that backdraft flap is designed to be used with the uh, fan 
in a kind of a, a horizontal position, if that makes sense. So if I was to turn the fan 90 degrees, then these flaps would be fighting against gravity and you don't really want that. So obviously when the fan's running, these flaps open up and there's just these tiny, tiny little springs up there that make the flap shut again. As I say, really tricky to get the camera in. But in case you're wondering, that's why the fan is on a little shelf. It's just to hold it in that kind of horizontal position rather than the easy option, which would be just to attach the fan to the wall. But as I say, you might then run into problems with the back draft flaps not working properly. And then one last little bit on the ductwork side. So I've attached the flexi into the outlet pipe on the wall there. And if you imagine when the back draft vents open or the flaps open, they're gonna come outwards in that direction. So if you just attach flexi straight onto that, what can sometimes happen is the back draft flaps get caught on the flexi hose. It, it's rare, but it does sometimes happen. So I generally prefer to just put a little, what's that, three inch or something, you know, 100 centimeters of pipe on that side. And it just means when these flaps open, it's not getting caught on the flippy flappy hose. The only thing is be careful not to over tighten this clip here, because what you don't want to do is make it so tight that the, um, the backdraft flaps don't open at all. It's just a hundred mil pipe straight onto this is a bit loose, so you do really need something. No, that's solid. Ain't going anywhere. And as an added benefit on this, the way that I've done this is that I've attached this one onto a little spigot. So it's just a coupler, a hundred mil coupler. And it means that if I ever want to get that off quickly for whatever reason, check that nothing's blocking it or something like that. It's got quite a firm friction fit in there, so it's not gonna go anywhere, but it just means we've got a nice easy access point to check what's going on. Perfect. So we're a few days on now. Sparky's been and done all his magic stuff, so everything is hooked up and ready to go. We've got the main isolator at the top there with a three amp fuse in it, which is what they recommend. So we'll pop that on. And then we've just got a single fan switch here that controls both fans effectively. So we can switch that on manually whenever we want. Wow. You literally can't, well, you can just hear it, it's so quiet. But just to prove it's actually working, there we go. And if I turn it off at the isolator, that'll switch the overrun off as well. So there we go. And then the toilet one is nice and happy as well. Extracting away, remember we only need six liters per second in the loo, so yeah, that's more than enough, that's great. Obviously this all still needs to be plastered, but uh, yeah, that's another job for another day. And then in the garage itself, there's the inline fan at the top there. It's running at the moment. I'm not sure if you can hear it. And then if I turn it off here at the fan switch, it's really difficult for you to hear, but it is still running. And then that ticks all the boxes for the overrun requirements and we are good to go. Anyway, folks, any questions, comments, or anything like that, Post them down below. Next time we're gonna be doing all of this. I've ended up refitting the waste because I was never particularly happy with this three quid one. As I say, we had all sorts of problems with it leaking and things. So I'm seriously hoping somewhere in my box of random waste plumbing bits, I've got a round overflow connector. Otherwise, I've got a bit of a problem. Go on now. So all very exciting. We're at the end stage with this now, I think, and I'm pretty pleased with how that's all turned out. I was a little bit kind of nervous about the ventilation thing, especially since it's a little bit pointless in this situation. We've got pretty much zero humidity in the utility room. We've got zero humidity, certainly in the toilet, but we do at least have something to take nasty smells away. As per usual, folks, be nice to one another, look after each other, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye. <laughs>